The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll begin in verse 11 and read through verse 25 there. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 11. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who were sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful." And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God... We pray for ears to hear, ears that hear your words, not whichever ones I place in the way, words that provoke us to action, words that provoke us to love, love of one another, the stranger, of you. Help us to hear your words now, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Sierra and Sabra were sisters. They were little girls. I don't mean just that they were young, but that they were little. Their mom and dad were probably five feet if you stacked them on top of each other. They started coming to our church uh, when we started having Wednesday night get-togethers for our kids and our youth. It wasn't much. We grill some cheese sandwiches, maybe throw out a couple bags of chips, pour out some lemonade and water or something. But they'd start showing up, about 20, 30 kids would start showing up on Wednesday afternoon. They'd play football out in the churchyard, and this is Texas, so it didn't matter what day it was, what the degree was, what time of year it was, they played football out in the churchyard, boys and girls. And then somebody would holler from the kitchen that the food was ready, We rotated it between grilled cheese, peanut butter and jelly, corn dogs, that was always my favorite, still is. I I have maybe a problem with corn dogs. (laughs) Then we might have hot dogs, and then if we had a fifth Wednesday night, we ordered pizza. And all these kids would come, and we'd play football. Somebody would say, food's ready, and we'd all run into the fellowship hall, say a little blessing, sit down at the folding chairs and the folding tables, eat our little supper, And then go into our little sanctuary where I would for as long as I could, which was usually about two minutes, tell a Bible story to these kids who went everywhere from little Sierra's age all the way up to 16, 17 years old. And then I would always ask if there were any prayer requests. Kids don't usually respond to that well, but every week little Sierra's hand went up. And I say, yes, Sierra, I knew what was coming. Pastor... She called me pasture, like cows grazed on me or something. (laughs) Pastor, I want to pray for my little dog, Peanut, and for my grandpa who's on oxygen. Okay, Sierra, we'll pray for Peanut and your grandpa. Does anybody want to pray? 
They don't go looking around. Adults do the same thing. You get them enough. They never want to make eye contact with the preacher. Oh, no, 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 no. They start looking around. And then reluctantly, sweet Tanner Wallace. That kid now, it's kind of crazy to me to think he's in his 20s, but Tanner would just fun and raise his hand. And I'd say, okay, Tanner, pray for us. And it was the same thing every week. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Be with the soldiers. Amen. Word for word. Except for one time. One time, I called on Tanner to pray, and he said, God, thank you for this day, and thank you for this moment, and be with the soldiers who were getting blowed up every 15 seconds. That's what he said. And we said, okay, amen. But every week, it was the same Thing. Those kids would even start getting off the bus in our church parking lot at like 3 in the afternoon. And they'd play football, and they'd come in and eat a grilled cheese sandwich, eat a corn dog, a bag of Doritos, hear a little Bible story, and go back outside and play more football. Every week, the same thing. Now, I know some of their mamas and daddies have better supper at home. I know some of them could have just said, well, I got a bigger yard. It ain't wet. There's not a dead spot over here. It's not close by the road. I got a big pasture. Let's just go over to my house and play football. They didn't want to listen to me tell a two-minute Bible story. And none of them wanted to pray. None of them wanted to talk about, well, why'd they do it? Why those 20 or 30 kids week after week after week show up in the parking lot of our little church? Every week. I thought about Jack and Bennett. Some of you might know them, so I won't say their last name. Jack and Bennett are a part of a crew that, well, there are three of them I learned at the Linlock Jacks, so now you can go by and see. There's a 7 a.m. crew, an 8 a.m. crew, and a 9 a.m. crew. Jack and Bennett were part of the 7 a.m. crew. Those are the ones who are retired and look for stuff to do. The 8 o'clock crew are the ones who are retired and say, wouldn't it be nice if we had something to do? And the 9 o'clock crew are the ones who say, we're retired and we ain't nothing we're going to do. <laughs> but Jack and Bennett always came at 7. And it was interesting to me. I went to breakfast with them one morning, and it was like this weird thing. I was in line behind Bennett and Jack. They walked up to the, the, the counter, and the woman didn't even ask them their order, just slid a tray Senior coffee, gravy biscuit, three slices of tomato. Bennett reached in his pocket and just threw the money on the counter. Didn't even count it. Jack did the same thing. Sausage biscuit, senior gravy. Here's a couple dollars and some change. I asked the woman, I said, what, is, what, what happened? She goes, they're in here every morning. Same breakfast, cost the same thing every morning. Jack once joked with me. He said, I used to have a dishwasher till it broke. I said, what happened? He said, all them Jack's wrappers got tied up in it. <laughs> Why do they do that? Every morning, every morning, Jack and Bennett go to that Jack's every morning. Life ain't changed a drop for them. Every morning, sitting in Jack's, sitting with those folks, talking about the same thing over and over and over. Why, why do they do that? Every day, every week, they're Jack. In their booths, gravy, biscuit, senior coffee. Why? Every day. Some of you may have seen the little news story about Luther Younger. It's one of those stories that comes on and you're like, thank goodness there's some good news still in the world. If you haven't, let me tell you about him. Luther is 99 years old, lives in Rochester, New York. And every morning he gets up and walks three miles to the hospital to visit his wife. And then walks three miles home every day. People pull over, say, Luther, you want to ride? You want No, no, I got to go. I ain't got time to talk. I ain't got time to wait on stop signs and red lights. And he walks, sometimes runs to see his wife. Every day he gets up, gets dressed, tucks his shirt in. Shaves his face, walks three miles one way, goes into the room, sees his wife, stays with her for some time, and then three miles back home every single day. Why does he do that? Nothing. It's not like he can't see her. He's got pictures all over his wall. She can't really respond. 
every day. Why does he do that? Or Jolene. I remember the first time I met Jolene, folks told me a little bit about her. She hardly ever leaves the house. She doesn't have a car, couldn't drive if she did. She sits in one chair in the corner of her living room in her little asbestos-sided house. And it's the one corner where the roof doesn't leak. She sits there most of the time every day, Monday to Saturday. She takes a bath every Saturday, like my grandma used to say, whether she needs it or not. She wakes up on Sunday morning. Puts on a sweatshirt, maybe a pair of sweatpants, some worn out yellow tennis shoes. And she takes her little walking stick, walks out the door and stands at the end of the sidewalk every Sunday morning waiting for that blue and white bus to pull up. And she climbs on, Tommy opens the door, she walks on, she sits down in her seat, doesn't say a word to anybody. And that bus drops her right at the front door of church. She gets out. She walks in. She sits in the back pew, middle of it. No one says a word to her. She doesn't go to Sunday school. Just sits there and waits. Not a lot of folks say much to Jolene. Maybe it's because she always looked kind of mean. You know them folks who look mean? But Jolene looked mean, and she was a little mean. But maybe it was because her clothes didn't smell clean, just smelled like they were always wet and left in a pile somewhere, and she just put them on. Her hair was always a bit greasy. You weren't really sure if she owned a toothbrush. And she always mostly just kept to herself in the pew. But there she was, every Sunday morning, every week. Why does she do that? Why does she do that? The writer of Hebrews talks about priests every day. It says, every day, day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices. Why would they do that? Well, because the Bible told them to. Folks sin, you got to make up for that sin. How do you do it? Well, you got to kill something. Kill it, burn it, do something. And so every day, the priests were there in their garb every morning, getting up, maybe having their breakfast, going through the rituals of uh, bathing themselves, dressing themselves in the right way, not just any old clothes. Every day, getting up, this vocation to which they had been called, to which they had been born. Every day, getting up, getting ready, going to the temple for the good folks who could afford it to come in and say, I've sinned, here are two turtle doves. That's this offering and sacrifice to God. Every day they'd get dressed. Every day, wash the blood from their hands, the smoke out of their hair, just to go to bed and wake up the next day, put on the same new clean clothes, do the same ritual bathing, to go back to the same temple. Why'd they do that? Well, in their minds, they had to do it. They had to do it because how else were the people's sins going to be forgiven? The writer of Hebrews says, you don't have to do that anymore. He says, Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin. And then he quotes Jeremiah about the things to come, about writing the covenant, uh, a new covenant, putting the laws on their hearts, writing them on their minds. You don't have to do that anymore. Every day, going to the temple. So why do we do this? Why does Jolene get up every week? Why did Sierra and Sabra come and meet in our little church to throw around a football, to eat burnt grilled cheese every week? Why do people get up every morning to sit around in the same booth, drinking the same bad coffee, eating the same indigestion causing gravy and biscuit? Why do they do that every day, every week? What makes a man get up every morning to walk three miles to see his wife? Why do we do that? You know they asked it because the writer ends our section there in verse 25. 
He says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. You know some of those early Christians did it. So used to getting up every day, taking their sacrifice to the temple. So used to the regular rhythms of the Jewish calendar. Oh, it's, it's time for Passover. Oh, it's time for the Festival of Tabernacles. Oh, it's time for Pentecost. Oh, it's time for this. Oh, it's time. They're so used to that rhythm. And then comes the word that Christ, one sacrifice for all, all this stuff is not necessary. We don't need to go through these rhythms anymore. Jesus has put the period on the sentence and we're done. Well, good. I'd like to go play golf on Sunday. Good. I'd like to go fishing. Good. I'd like to go do something else. I don't have to go do that. If Jesus paid it all, then I don't have to pay with my time in a pew on Sunday morning. If Jesus paid it all, I don't have to bring my sacrifice to the temple anymore. It's over. It's done. You know, some of them thought it. Because I know people still think it. You probably heard the old preacher joke, I'm sure, but I'm going to tell it anyway. You can write it down. He told a preacher joke today. Baptist, Methodist minister sitting there. They had bats in the church steeple in the belfry. Methodist said, I don't know. We've tried everything we can do to get rid of them. Baptist preacher said, well, there's one thing that's a surefire way to make sure they'll never come back. Methodist preacher said, what's that? He said, just baptize them. <laughs> baptize them and they'll never come back. Yeah, folks do it. It's, it's funny because you know somebody in your life, somebody you're thinking about even right now. It was true then. Do not forget. He says, do not neglect to meet together. But why in the world did you do it? Because the Bible says so, friends, is not a good enough reason. Why do we do it? What makes folks want to get up early on a Sunday morning? Some of you, this is the only day you've got off. What makes you get up and come to worship? What is it? I think it has a lot to do with what the writer says in verse 24. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. We don't come to this place just to check it off on the calendar. You don't say to folks you belong to a church just so you can have some, some identity, some way you can say, yeah, yeah, I checked the box. No. Every week, week after week, you come in this place, my hope, my prayer is to be provoked by the Spirit of God to works of love and good works for God's kingdom. Now, some folks like to come and argue. Some folks like to come and just sit. And you know what? That's fine too. What would the church be? How would we provoke one another without such things? The writer says, provoke one another to love and good deeds. Not neglecting to meet together. As if it's necessary to come together so that we may provoke one another to what Christ is calling us. Why do two little girls meet with a bunch of kids on a Wednesday night? Because there's something bigger than themselves. Because there's something that calls them there that they can't even quite yet understand. Why? Why does, does Tanner, or did Tanner always raise his hand to say the prayer? Because he knew somebody had to pray for these folks. They come together because there's something bigger than what they understand. Why do people gather together to do the same things over and over and over again? It's not just because they're stuck in a rut, maybe, but not just because. But because in that moment around scalding hot coffee, around the chitter chatter of morning breakfast in a fast food restaurant, there is something holy, something communal. It's what makes a man get up to go see his wife. It's what makes a woman who sits in the dark corner of her house all week long get up and get dressed and get on a bus and sit in the pew. It's something bigger than we are. It's something that overshadows all of us. With all of our differences, with all of our sameness, it's something bigger than all of us. And it's what calls us to the table 
You ever wonder, some of you probably, we're doing this again? We do it over and over, not because it's ritual, not because it's rote, because in this bread and in this cup, we are reminded of something bigger than us. We are reminded of something greater than us. We are reminded of the provocation of God to love each other and to do the good deeds and the good work of his kingdom. So as we stand on a Sunday morning prior to Thanksgiving, we come to the table of Thanksgiving. The Greek word for communion is eucharisto, which means, get this, thanksgiving. And so here we are in this place, some of you again, and here we are at the table and listening to God's provocation, the spirits provoking us to acts of love and good deeds. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come to your table now, we pray you bless this time. And may we be tentative to your Holy Spirit and its provocation to love and the work of your kingdom. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.